Hi everyone, uh, welcome today for the Web EV Talk Series on the 28th September 2021. And it's my pleasure to have Aisha Salim from Canada. She's the Principal Investigator and Assistant Professor at the University of Manitoba, Canada. So uh, Dr. Salim is an Assistant Professor in the Faculty of Kinesiology at the University of Manitoba and a Principal Investigator at the Children's Hospital Research Institute of Manitoba. She has expertise in molecular and cellular physiology, specializing in mitochondrial metabolisms and EV biology. And her current research program is designed to delineate how EVs regulate the interplay between host tissue and imposed physiological challenges. So these challenges can be physiological exercise, age, or metabolic, such as cancer or obesity, or developmental, such as breastfeeding. So, um, today, her uh, lecture is about effect of maternal asthma status on breast milk derived extracellular vesicles and their role in regulating inflammation in airway smooth muscle cells. So before we start, um, I'd like to thank Horiba Scientific for sponsoring this session. And um, I also have a uh, questions to uh, Aisha, but um, what makes you interested to work with EVs before we start? <laughs> <laughs> sure. And I know this is a new thing that you're starting, so I'm, I'm glad to be the, the guinea pig here. Um, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to talk. I'm really excited. Um, I think EVs are just amazing in how, uh, you know, how many things they can do, how versatile they are, how they are... Uh, conserved across species, across evolution. And that excites me because if there's something that is so primitive and yet so important that is still existing in this day and age uh, in our bodies and around us in other living creatures, then the importance of that um, uh, structure or molecule, or in this case, extracellular vesicle cannot be uh, understated. So I'm excited because I did seem to do everything. <laughs> They're involved in every process. And there's so much to learn and so much to contribute. So I mm. hope I play a, me and my lab plays a small role in that. All right. And again, thank you very much, Carolina, for the invitation. And um, I'm just going to give a little uh, brief background on how I got involved in it. So I'm an early career researcher. I finished my postdoctoral fellowship in around 2016, and I followed that up with uh, three years or kind of overlapped it with teaching at a college to get that teaching experience in before I started as an assistant professor and principal investigator at the University of Manitoba and the Children's Hospital. And if you have never been to Canada and if you've never been to Manitoba, this is where we are, this red province here. Uh, I'm in Winnipeg, but if you come to Winnipeg, which is somewhere here at the base, and you go up north, you can go see the Northern Lights, which are beautiful during winter time. So if you can brave the minus 50 Celsius temperatures, that's what awaits you. Uh, we're also the polar bear capital of the world. Um, this is our beautiful campus. Uh, we have beautiful prairie skies uh, that are just gorgeous to look at. And this is where my lab is, it's the other campus uh, associated with the Children's Hospital uh, and the Medical University at um, uh, University of Manitoba. Now it is tradition in, in Winnipeg to start with the land acknowledgement uh, because I, while I may be speaking to you on Zoom, I am in Winnipeg and that land does not belong to us. Uh, these campuses are located on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, the Cree, the OG Cree, Dakota and Dene peoples and on the homeland of the Métis nations. And we respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. So just a brief, brief background of how I got into EVs and I'll be really quick with this. Um, my background is mus skeletal muscle biologist, physiologist, and uh, what I started doing in my master's and, and worked along in my PhD was looking at the role of P53, which is Anyone who's working in cancer, they have heard about it. It's a little protein that could, um, and it's been studied extensively in cancer, but we started looking at it in its role in regulating mitochondrial capacity and metabolism in skeletal muscle 
in very physiological context. So looking at their exercise performance, you know, wild type versus knockout, knockout had a lot less ability to exercise, they had less markers of uh, metabolic capacity like Cox activity, their mitochondria were messed up in the knockout animals versus wi wild type, and they respired less. And, you know, during my PhD, I kept following up on this and I looked at how acute exercise can recruit a tumor suppressor protein and make it leave the nucleus. This is the recovery period in the black bar and from the nucleus go into the two distinct mitochondrial pools that exist in muscle, which is really surprising because this is a nuclear transcription factor that works in the nucleus. So why is it leaving the muscle and going, uh, the nucleus and going into the mitochondria? Uh, well, we found that it's actually bound to mitochondrial DNA with exercise and recovery and their putative response elements in the, the DNA, in the D-loop region of the mitochondrial DNA. And when you take animals that are knockout for P53 and you exercise them, mitochondrial DNA transcripts like cytochrome C oxidase 1 mRNA is not increased as is normal in wild type um, animals. So uh, I did a, I, I have a habit of uh, becoming, uh, I think, obsessed with something <laughs> that is fascinating. And it was the case with P53. And I researched it as much as I could. And then during my postdoc, I changed tracks and started looking at the systemic effects of exercise. And that actually brought me to extracellular vesicles. And now that is my new obsession and passion in life. Um, so as I said, I'm an exercise physiologist by training. And you know, we've known for hundreds of years that exercise is good for you. It does everything. It improves your fertility. It improves your, you know, delays the aging process. It improves your self-esteem. It reduces obesity, diabetes. Uh, and you could argue that you're evolutionarily adapted to run. And yet we choose to do the exact opposite, which I think has been exacerbated in, in pandemic times. Unfortunately, you know, we can't really do much about it, but we have to ensure that we get up and move after every hour or so of sitting at the computer. Um, so my lab is looking at how the systemic effects of exercise are being mediated by extracellular vesicles, which I know uh, needs no introduction in this crowd. And, um, Interestingly for us, what we found was that we already know that EVs carry all of these different molecules, whether they're proteins or nucleic acids or lipids, uh, but we knew that they also carry proteins that are released from muscle called myokines that regulate systemic benefits associated with exercise. So that's how we, I got into this after my postdoc, and uh, I want to study how you know EVs or exosomes from muscle are regulating these systemic effects. But coming to a place like Manitoba put me in touch with a lot of different researchers uh, who were working in so many niche areas, and it was hard not to collaborate and, and kind of uh, work together because that's how science gets forward uh, by people with different interests working together. So my lab is focused on looking at our core uh, studies, which are you know, evaluating the effect of EVs in regulating mitochondrial capacity and metabolism using basic and translational models. But because of our proximity to researchers who uh, are clinician scientists, who work with cohort studies, who work with children, especially pediatric population, uh, who work with children who have obesity, who have asthma, We've been able to grow our uh, and, and take on more clinical and translational studies. And that's the one that I'm going to be showing you today, which is uh, called the child study. So what is the child study? It is one of the largest general population based longitudinal birth cohorts in Canada. And it has allowed Canadian researchers and also collaborators, international collaborators, to look at the developmental origins of health and disease, in particular asthma, but also diabetes and obesity. Um, what it allows us researchers to do, uh, those who are uh, collaborating with child, is to look at how early environment, so maternal factors, paternal factors, breastfeeding, 
you know, exposure to allergens, dust, uh, obviously genetics affects a child's propensity to develop asthma and allergies, as well as other non-communicable diseases like obesity and diabetes. So the cohort enrolled uh, families starting in around 2009 to 2012. And we have about 3,621 pregnant mothers who are enrolled in this cohort. And out of these, uh, about 30, uh, 300, let's say, children who are still eligible and participating in the study. Uh, the families were recruited in Canada, Toronto, Vancouver, and Winnipeg and Edmonton. So that's um, four different cities in Canada. And the retention rate from this cohort study has been about 90%, which is impressive for a study of this size. And what has been collected as part of the study, uh, the primary endpoint was a physician diagnosed asthma as, at age five, uh, as well as age three. Uh, there were also secondary endpoints. Uh, mainly, as I said, it started off as, uh, as, an, as, you know, as a study to evaluate how allergy and asthma develops in children. But afterwards, other parameters like metabolomics, immunological function, uh, obesity, and, and uh, type two diabetic related um, enzyme assays were added as well. So uh, we have, we collect data from mothers before birth, at birth, after birth, at three-year follow-up, five-year follow-up, and so on. Children uh, with the, the offspring from these mothers have also been uh, called into the lab and they've been followed up at three years, five years, and so on. And every time they come into the lab, there's a whole host of different Samples that are taken, uh, blood, urine, um, for mothers, breast milk, uh, and there are different functional tests that are done on the children themselves, pulmonary, pulmonary function tests, uh, lung uh, function tests. And then there's about 400 questionnaires that have been used from pregnancy to five years. And these questionnaires cover the gamut of uh, all of the um, environmental factors that we can uh, think of. So, uh, you know, uh, how exclusively were the children breastfed? Were they put in daycare? Were they exposed to medications, antibiotics? Is the mother allergic to something? The socioeconomic status, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the mental health of the mother, uh, of the father as well, and so on and so forth. So there's a whole lot of data available. And you can apply to get access to it. And that's what researchers have been doing with this cohort study. And there has been a lot of important key findings that have been released, many associated with breastfeeding and mainly that breastfeeding protects against obesity, against asthma, against allergies. Uh, it is different uh, if you breastfeed directly at the breast versus uh, you know, expressing milk and pumping it and giving it to babies. Um, that breast milk can pass good bacteria from the mother to the offspring. But if you were to look even more closely, we, there are some really key discoveries that have been made about breast milk and their effects of asthma. Before we get to that, just a reminder that breast milk is not just you know, uh, a source of nutrition. Of course, it is the primary source of nutrition for uh, children, or it should be uh, when they're young, uh, from six months of age to two years of age, if possible. But it also has a lot of other things which are um, really, really beneficial for optimal child growth and development. And this includes hormones, growth factors, stem cells, bacteria, vitamins and minerals, and uh, macrophages, and so on. I would like to say that based on the work by others in the field, uh, I know Dr. Martha Wobin was here, I think last month, explaining all the work that their lab has um, done, which is just so uh, seminal in this field. I think we should you know, modify this and add extracellular vesicles here as well, because EVs are found in breast milk. And knowing what we know about EVs, I think more and more people and more and more milk scientists are recognizing that we need to study EVs and what they're doing in milk as well. So coming back to breast milk and asthma, uh, the main findings from the child study so far have been that breast milk is protective 
uh, against early development of asthma. And I'm gonna show you one set of data from a paper that was published a couple of years ago. Uh, and just to orient you on the bottom, we have uh, children that were directly breast uh, fed, children that were uh, indirectly breastfed, so expressed milk when milk is pumped and given to kids, as well as uh, direct breastfeeding. One where there was a combination of formula and direct and indirect breastfeeding, and the last one with formula. And what it shows is the possible or probable onset of asthma at three years of age in children. And what we found was that uh, breastfeeding was protective and any other means of breastfeeding uh, other than direct breast milk at the breast increased the odds ratio of the child developing asthma at three years of age. We don't know why that is. It could be a number of different reasons. It could be the composition of breast milk, whether it's microbiota inside it, whether it's EVs. It could be the skin-to-skin -skin contact. Maybe there's some transfer of microbiota. Uh, it could be just the physical action of suckling uh, that the offspring has to uh, uh, perform to get the breast milk that is affecting their asthma development. We don't really know. But we know what we know from this data was that direct breastfeeding was protective uh, and reduced the odds of offspring developing asthma at three years. So just to recap what asthma is, I'm sure uh, uh, you have all heard about it. It is one of the most prevalent childhood diseases. Uh, there is no cure for it. There is ways to monitor it and control it, uh, but it's characterized by muscle tightness, by uh, airway hyper-responsiveness, by inflammation, and an inability to, to breathe. And there are many, many different causes of asthma from you know, genetic reasons to environmental exposures like exposure to smoking or cannabis smoke or pollutants or chemicals. And of course, uh, coming from the mother's side, breastfeeding has been found overall to be protective against developing asthma. But having said that, there is research that shows something completely different where breast milk has had no effect. So we're not exactly sure whether or not uh, there is a causative role here or a protective role. We are, breast milk scientists agree that there's likely a beneficial protective effect, but we don't know the mechanisms involved. And this is where my lab came in. Uh, so we decided to work together with uh, uh, a asthma uh, scientist and a lung physiologist, Dr. Andrew Haleko, who's been in the field for about 20, 30 years. And uh, the first thing we wanted to do was just during the pandemic, when we had to shut down our lab and we had to adapt to an online situation, uh, we decided to do a systematic review on, on extracellular ves vesicles and all the information that has been published to date on whether they can rescue or attenuate uh, asthma in pre- preclinical models. Uh, so this was done primarily by a summer student, Jennifer Kent, uh, and my PhD student, Patience Obi. And they, uh, you know, uh, identified articles using your inclusion exclusion criteria, and basically, I didn't, you know, filtered it down to about 18 studies that we were able to include in our quantitative analysis. And the main conclusions from this, which we are about to publish very soon is, that EVs that were derived from primarily stem cell origins seem to prevent asthma development. And they did that in various different ways, whether they reduced the inflammatory cell infiltration, uh, whether they decreased uh, TH2-related cytokine production in BALF, which is the bronchial alveolar lavage fluid, the fluid that's in the lungs, whether they reduced airway hyper-responsiveness and resistance, the two hallmarks of asthma, uh, or whether they uh, attenuated the remodeling and the fibrosis that develops with, with in asthma preclinical models. But overall, what all we found from the systematic review was that EVs were able to rescue or prevent the pathogenesis of asthma. So that looks that, that was really cool, but those are EVs coming from mesenchymal stem cells or adipocyte-derived stem cells. What about EVs from breast milk? And 
you know, work by uh, others. And this is Dr. Matthew, uh, I think a review paper from Dr. Matthew Vanden's lab, which really beautifully summarized all of the different cells that are able to release EVs directly into the breast milk. And uh, there is research that has shown that these milk derived EVs can cross the, uh, the gut uh, barrier, cross the epithelial cell lines and be taken up by macrophages in the host cell. So we know that when you drink milk, it gets to the gut. There are papers that have shown that can survive the harsh environments, the low pH, and there are papers that have shown in vitro usually uh, proof so far that these EVs can cross the intestinal epithelial layer. Uh, and these milk EVs have been linked with immunoregulation, growth and development, neurodegenerative diseases, and so on. So what we decided to do was combine our strengths and look at extracellular vesicles in human breast milk, but use the child's cohort study and try and find a link between the EVs in breast milk and asthma. And we know that breast milk contains EVs, and we know that they clearly have a role in asthma regulation. So we asked ourselves two basic questions. One, does the maternal status of asthma affect EVs by characterization or protein expression or, or cargo content? And two, what is the effect of these EVs derived from mothers that are healthy or those that have asthma on the risk of asthma development in their offspring? So uh, this work uh, was primarily done by my postdoctoral fellow who just completed her fellowship in the lab in August, and that's Tiana Pierdona. And she was assisted by a high school student who we recruited in grade 12, who actually is now in university and came back this summer. So get them early and get them young and get them in the lab, you know, so that was great. Um, but we have a larger hypothesis, but what I'm gonna show today is just, um, EV data from mothers who are healthy versus mothers who have asthma. Eventually, what we want to do is also look at mother maternal asthma status, but kind of correlated with offsprings that have asthma. The data that I'm showing today, none of the offsprings had asthma. So the only thing that's different between the, the, the participants is that whether or not the mother has asthma or whether the mother is controlled. So, uh, and this was a pilot project. Um, we, we started with an N of five in control and N of five in, in the asthma group. And the milk was collected from mothers at around three to four months post birth. Um, the mothers were age matched, uh, matched for BMI, they were all Caucasian. And the only, I mean, as much as we could, the only difference between the control and the uh, treated group was that the, or the, patient group was that the patient group had asthma or allergies. Uh, incidentally, this breast milk was actually, because the study started in 2008 and 2012, some of these samples had been frozen and sitting in minus 80 for about six to eight years and obviously not thawed repeatedly. Uh, so we were a little uh, hesitant when we started the project, but actually turned out beautifully. We were able to extract EVs from these old frozen uh, samples of, of breast milk. Uh, the first thing we did was obviously get rid of the fat globules and just um, get the breast milk serum. And after getting the filtered serum, we used size exclusion chromatography to collect uh, fractions seven to nine, which we know and others, many others have shown that they're enriched with small EVs. And we obviously characterized them by TRPS using Q nano gold and uh, concentrated these samples and then use them for um, further analysis. So the first thing here is size uh, distribution. We have control in black and asthma in purple, and we have the different size ranges at the bottom. And you can see quite clearly that in the asthma group, there was almost a seven-fold increase in the amount of EVs in breast milk per mil of breast milk, which was very, very surprising, but seem to have a huge increase in, in, in the population of small EVs floating around. And if we did an overall EV concentration analysis, we found that again, the asthma group seemed to have more EVs in circulation. 
And BCVs were smaller than the control group. Didn't come reach quite uh, quite reach significance, but I think that's because of the low sample size. Uh, the zeta potential was, you know, pretty similar between the control and asthma groups here. We then extensively characterized uh, these EVs for markers of exosomes and microvesicles. So we looked at, we ensured that our fractions, first of all, the 789 that we took with the SCC were all enriched in small EV markers like CD9, CD81, CD63, and TSG101, as well as HSC70 and flotillin. And they didn't have the markers associated with microvesicles like MMP2 and R6. So we're pretty confident these fractions are small EVs enriched. There was some APOA1 expression, uh, which is, uh, you know, across control and asthma samples was unavoidable. Uh, we looked at the protein yield, and really there was no difference between the total amount of protein yield between fraction 79 in control and asthma groups. And uh, my tech, uh, my research text, the near safe, did this beautiful uh, uh, TEM analysis, and we found that our isolated EVs were non-aggregated, and they look they look good. So they fit the size profile, and you know uh, they appear to be exosomes or enriched with exosomes at the very least. Uh, so then we, you know, the same proteins that we looked at to ensure that our fraction seventy nine were enriched in small EVs, we looked at their expression within. The EVs from control and asthma, and these are representative blots shown here. And uh, we looked at all the exosome markers, CD81, 63 was the only one that was reduced in asthma, uh, CD9, flotillin, TSG101, HSP70. MMP2 did not show up at all in our neither EVs from control nor from asthma group, uh, as, and APOA1 was there as we expected. And, this is the graphical representation. So basically flotillin one and CD63 expression was reduced in the asthma group, which is kind of surprising because they seem to be enriched in small EVs and yet they don't really express a lot of the uh, uh, canonical proteins associated with small EVs, but you know that, that is what the profile is uh, for these um, EVs from these asthma moms. So uh, next, what we wanted to do was look at uh, the protein content inside uh, the breast milk derived EVs. And I think we used about one mil of breast milk, which is the nice thing about using breast milk. You're not that limited by uh, sample size, sample volume, as you would be if you were using, I guess, plasma perhaps. And uh, these are the all the 10 samples. There's control and patient in here. This is the uh, SDS page gel showing the protein expression uh, within, I think, 50 or 70, 50 to 75 micrograms of protein per lane. And you can see that there is some individual differences, obviously, as because you know human research means different people have slight differences in how they express proteins. Uh, but nonetheless, we were able to get a good amount from each. Uh, set and we use the uh, TNT based proteomics, which I am not an expert in. <laughs> so I will hopefully there's not too many questions on that. But um, briefly, this allows for multiplexing of proteomics. So each sample gets labeled by a different tag, and you can concurrently look at the mass spec profile of all of your different proteins from all of the different samples. Now, because I'm not an expert in this, I had to make sure that I found someone who could help me analyze the data. And this is our, our collaborator and our uh, dear friend, Dr. Karakash, who works at Dalhousie University. And um, he and I spent Saturday, Sunday afternoon, about one hour going over the data. So this is fresh out of the oven. Uh, this is principal component analysis uh, showing the that the asthma group in red are expressing proteins that are differentially um, at a differential level than the healthy group. We need to complete the analysis and generate the heat maps and do uh, further enrichment uh, analysis. But the one thing that stuck out at this point was the expression of mucine 4. This one was highly expressed in asthma uh, EVs 
but not expressed in control. And I, uh, you know, we have to do the validation and make sure that we can confirm these findings by Western blood. But coincidentally, mucin-4 is involved in asthma pathogenesis. So it's actually not surprising that EVs from mothers with asthma would be enriched with a protein that's involved in asthma. Uh, next, we decided to do co-culture experiments. Uh, so we uh, are working with Dr. Dr. Andrew Haleko, who I mentioned before. He has the, I think, one of the largest repositories of human telomerase. RT immortalized uh, airways muscle cells from both asthmatic and non-asthmatic donors. So we took these human airway smooth muscle cells, we cultured them with or without EVs, and uh, we uh, did a time course experiment, uh, 0, 12, 24, 48 hours after breast milk EV exposure. And in the presence of IL-1 beta, and IL-1 beta is usually used to challenge these cells. Uh, it's commonly used in asthma studies, and it, it you know, uh, because often you have to challenge a physiological system to see any differences. And uh, this work is ongoing right now. We started by doing an ELISA on the um, uh, on the supernatant or the conditioned media, and we're doing a multiplex as well on the conditioned media. So. First, we wanted to make sure that the cells uh, look good and we can measure EV uptake into them. So this again is, is work done by my text in the RSA. Here she used confocal microscopy to label EVs in green, um, actin in red and DAPI in blue. And she got these beautiful images confirming that our EVs that are being put on these cells are in fact being taken up. We don't know the exact mechanism by which they're being taken up, but it, they're clearly within the cell. And uh, we also can see them in phase contrast and regular AP fluorescent microscopy. So we, we took EVs from control mothers and asthma, asthmatic mothers uh, from the breast milk, and we put them on cells. Uh, and we put them on control cells, cells derived from healthy people or people who didn't have asthma, as well as cells derived from asthmatic donors. The first thing we wanted to make sure that there's no changes in EV viability. So that looks you know, good uh, across the board here with PBS and, and control and asthmatic breast milk EVs. And this is our positive control, uh, Tritonex. And next we wanted to look at, uh, oops, uh, the IL-6 release. So let me just orient you to this graph and the others would be really easy to follow. So this is IL-6 release basally from airway smooth muscle cells from control and an asthmatic patient. We have PBS, then we have EVs in control in black and EVs from asthmatic mothers in purple. And what you can see here is clearly that every time cells were treated with EVs from mothers with asthma, there was a suppression or a kind of a attenuation of the amount of IL-6 that was released from these cells, both from control cells, as well as from cells that were you know, uh, isolated from patients with asthma. And we saw this effect basally much more pronounced, but not so much when we uh, treated the cells with IL and beta induction. That's where the difference kind of disappeared. And you can see IL-1 beta causes massive IL-6 release. We're looking at the numbers here in 5,000 range, whereas here is 100 fold lower. So another way to express this data was as fold over uh, control. And this is in the absence of IL-1 beta, we see that breast milk, EVs from mothers with asthma seems to suppress the amount of a pro-inflammatory cytokine. And this difference disappears when uh, the cells are challenged with IL-1 beta. Not significant. And again, uh, because this was a pilot study, uh, if, I think we are limited by sample size and we definitely need to go back and include more samples. Uh, I think this, this will become significant once we increase that. And uh, this is just a very common feature of doing human work. The, uh, the multiplex results, so this was an ELISA for IL-6. We also have a multiplex experimental data from the Supernate that came in on Thursday last week. And I tried my best to get all the data analyzed, but I couldn't. 
So hopefully we're going to get that done soon and, and publish it uh, or at least bioarchive and pre-print it within the month. Um, but just to summarize our findings, what we found was that EVs that were isolated from mothers with asthma versus without were enriched with small EVs. There was a sevenfold higher concentration of EVs in the 150 nanometer range. Uh, they had smaller overall average EV size. They expressed um, less CD63 and flotillin-1, which are markers of small EVs. And they have different proteomic cargo, and this is still in the works right now, but one protein that was highly expressed in these asthmatic uh, EVs was mucin-4. Most interestingly, they seem to suppress the release of a pro-inflammatory IL-6, and whether they do that to other inflammatory cytokines that are involved in asthma, we'll, we're about to uh, figure that out. The question is, are they protective? or are they playing a causal role? And we're not, I don't think we're any, close, any closer to the answer right now, but it would be nice to hypothesize that nature is, uh, person, you know, uh, uh, nature is smart. It's not gonna cause breastfeeding to lead to early development of asthma in the, in the child, but that's just a hypothesis. It could be the other way around as well. Nature is dumb too. Like I was stressed about my presentation yesterday. So my body decided to put two pimples on my face, which was not needed. Um, the other thing we are also trying to do right now is to ensure that we get data that shows that breast milk EVs can cross the gut epithelial layer. So we're using um, EVs packed with Cree and we're gonna use a mouse model to show uptake of uh, or uh, expression of reporter uh, uh, EGFP upon pre recombination once it passes the epithelial layer. And we're also doing some in vitro uh, cell work. And again, the results are in process thanks to COVID. <laughs> Things are a lot slower than I thought. Um, and at the end, I just want to end with this uh, disclaimer that uh, breast milk scientists and lactation specialists, while we love and you know we, we think that breast milk is undoubtedly rich and, and very good for children, as well as mothers, it does not mean that it should be used to, uh, you know, uh, used against mothers who choose not to breastfeed or who are unable to do so. So that is not the purpose of this research at all. I was actually allergic to my own mom's breast milk, so, um, you know, I turned out okay. So it's not the be all and end all of everything, but we're hopefully trying to find uh, ways in which we can, uh, you know, mimic the protective effects and, 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 you know, transmit it to as many offspring as possible, especially children who cannot be breastfed by their mothers. So at this point, I just want to thank my lab. Um, we're, we started in 2018, uh, 2019 was when the trainees got into the lab and then the lab shut down in 2020, which I'm sure is a common story for everyone, uh, but they've done really well despite all the challenges. Um, and all the collaborators, Dr. Azad, who is our main collaborator from the child study, who got us the breast milk samples, our uh, bioinformatics and uh, lung physiologist, Dr. Haleko and Dr. Karakash, as well as uh, the funding organizations. And I'll be happy to take any questions at this point. Okay, thank you so much, Aisa. Wonderful presentation. Sounds very interesting as well. Um, so I'll, I'll uh, stop your screen share first. So I'll at this time invite um, people who wants to ask questions. You can just raise your hand and uh, jump in. But I'll start with my questions first, I think, since I have the chance. So um, uh, just a little bit, probably a little bit. Um, that you sort of cover uh, about the EVs from the stem cell origin that seems to prevent asthma development. Um, have you, um, how, how do you know that this is from the stem cells that help that? Um, can you talk a little oh, bit sure. about the details? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So we did a the systematic review we did, um, looked at a number of papers that were published on the topic. And most of them utilized uh, either in vitro or uh, murine models. So they would isolate EVs from mesenchymal stem cells in culture and maybe inject it into a mouse model of 
uh, asthma, whether it was through house dust mite exposure or ovalbumin uh, exposure, and then they measured indices of uh, hallmarks of asthma development like airway hyperresponsiveness or uh, fibrosis. Uh, in vivo, they also looked at uh, adipocytes derived stem cells um, and taking EVs from that and putting it on uh, uh, epithelial cells and airway spoon muscle cells and seeing their effect. So we included, uh, we wanted to include all types of preclinical studies and uh, we didn't just restrict it to just mouse. So anytime um, they used EVs um, and as long as there was, you know, mice have, we checked for mice have, uh, criteria that narrowed down the list a lot. So we had, I think, uh, 36 articles and we reduced that by half uh, once we started checking for MISEV and if they didn't check, characterize EVs, then we didn't include them because it could be anything. Mm. Uh, but yeah, that's basically what, what we had. Mm. So in that case, I was wondering, so what, what, what then, um, how, how, if it's like from cow's milk, because the formula from the cow's milk, will that actually have any EV benefits at all since it will be like cow's microphage? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> what do you think? No, no, I, you know, that's a great question. I mean, there's so many, and I guess at this, you, you should, we should remember at that point that there's so many other things in, in milk other than EVs as well. So antibiotics and, you know, if, if cows are being given antibiotics or growth hormones, they can filter in through into the milk and how that affects child development. I don't know if anyone has looked at that yet. Um, it, it, it definitely is something that should be researched for sure. And mm. how EVs, I know I haven't, there are lots of people in Europe who are doing this excellent work with cow's milk and looking at the EVs there, uh, as well as in Australia. So I would have to refer to them as to whether it's good or good or bad. We're focusing on the human milk side of things for now. Hmm. And then also, uh, I think my second question is coming from uh, these EVs from asthma mothers. Um, since it looks like they increase, uh, does increase the secretion of uh, small EVs and in many different diseases, it's also been uh, shown that uh, stress increase that um, EV uh, secretion. There's also like, you know, um, increase of small EVs in the systemic circulation for cancer patients, for example. Mm -hmm. So um, do you have any theory how that happens in uh, asthma context? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, it's, it could be a sign of the pathology uh, because of the asthma, there's more, somehow there's more production of small EVs. Maybe there are the uh, microvesicular, uh, you know, fusion with plasma membrane is increased. Maybe there's more MVB synthesis. Maybe there's more upstream signals causing that release. I, I mean, at the same time, it could also be uh, a negative feedback loop, like nature devised breastfeeding as the primary means of providing nutrition to children from you know zero to two years of age let's say or six months at least wouldn't it wouldn't it make sense if it, it tried to circumvent uh something that was wrong by providing more of a signal I, i'm mm -hmm. not sure i'm completely hypothesizing but it would be really encouraging if that was the case because we definitely don't want to demonize or discourage mothers who have asthma and they're breastfeeding their children because it's still protective. There's still beneficial effects. Hmm. But what are EVs doing in that context? I, I don't know. I mean, the fact that they suppressed IL-6 release looks like it might be beneficial. And that was a physiological dose that we gave them. So we didn't, we didn't give control, like we didn't give 50 micrograms of EVs or the same concentration of EVs. We took EVs from... 200 microliters of milk and we put them on cells. Mm. There was a physiological mm. dose mm. and it seemed to reduce the release of an inflammatory cytokine. So maybe there might be a protective effect. Don't know, too early to say. Yeah. I, I like to lean towards the latter one for sure. Yeah, yeah. it is, it is a very, com uh, very interesting and sort of like, it's very hard to set up when you have a large, um, cohort of patients and it's also longitudinal so I really recommended you for uh, running this study I know that 
it's really hard to uh, get into uh, this sort of data. And uh, just wondering if you have uh, sort of advice on um, when to collect the breast milk for the study, where the diet actually have some effect and so on for people who's actually interested to study breast milk in the future. Yeah, I mean, those, you know, there's so much to be done there because breast milk can be different, uh, whether it's colostrum, the early breast milk that is immediately produced in the first week versus mature milk. I know our milk is uh, three months of age. And we have the same concentration that I know Dr. Uh, Wobbin was saying that they got in their mature milk, mature milk that, it, that was at seven to nine months of age. Uh, but ours seem to be suppressing IL-6 release, whereas I was just listening to her talk the other day. Theirs was the other way around. So I was like, what's going on? But there was a, on a different cell type. So the, the time at which the breast milk is taken, how, you know, whether it's mature or early milk could have an effect, how it's taken, was it, uh, you know, aliquoted and frozen directly in minus 80, or was it left in the fridge overnight? Because that can affect how much EVs survive. Um, our EVs were isolated from, as I said, samples that were frozen in some cases for eight years or even longer. And they were frozen as whole milk. And we were like, yeah, are we going to get something from it? And we actually managed to get a pretty significant amount of EVs from those milks. So clearly they would stand being frozen. Um, but uh, it, just like with plasma, you have to be, you know, how you, which kind of needle you take to isolate the blood and all of those things. I think we have to start standardizing when the milk is collected. Uh, is it immediately put in the fridge or overnight and then minus 80 or ideally you should be separating it into breast milk filtered breast milk or serum of the breast milk so you remove the fatty globules um, because that does interfere with EV isolation but uh, it's it's a you know a step in the we got to start doing it before we can standardize it I think more people need to definitely get involved um, did that mm -hmm. answer your question I think there's a little yeah to it yeah yeah um yeah, um, I think with the colostrum, I think it, it's really sort of like, it's hard for, for us to, uh, it's a big ask for the mom to give up the colostrum, isn't it? I mean, it's a, yeah. such a precious thing. So I'm sure there will be like very interesting study to compare between the early uh, breast milk that has the colostrum and the one which is not, but to get that sample itself, I'm sure it's not that easy. Um, so yeah. So Maimona, please go ahead. Uh, if you can turn on your um, mic and uh, turn on your video as well. Yeah, hi. Yeah, hi. thank you so much for the brilliant talk. Yeah, uh, and thank it's you. very interesting now, EVs, it's like, um, it's like a new area and it's very interesting. And uh, it, maybe it has, it carries explanation for many things that we didn't know before, like the pathogenesis of many diseases and all like, yeah, it's a whole new, uh, interesting area. So I have a question here uh, regarding the micro vesicles because I can see um, extracellular vesicle, people are very obsessed with small extracellular vesicles and exosome. So how about micro vesicles? Do you think they, they, they maybe something interesting also will come out of studying them? I mean, in terms of, uh, in the context of asthma and development. This is uh, number one. Uh, number two, I don't know if I missed this, but are you going to do a follow-up study with um, uh, breastfed children or kids who were breastfed with this uh, uh, from asthmatic mothers? So to, to follow up, like, are they going to develop asthma or not? Yeah. Because like but, my kids are asthmatic, although I'm not, I'm, I'm not asthmatic, but my kids are asthmatic. I think the genes are playing a role here because from, from the parent, from their father's side, their family right. have asthma. So I was wondering maybe, yeah. So there are many things, I mean, playing a role in this, yeah. 100%. So, and thank you so much for those questions, questions yeah. Memona. Yeah. yeah. I'll start with the second one. I mean, we definitely want to, I think I, I talked on the study design slide. So we are looking right now at mothers with and without asthma, but their children had not developed asthma at three years of age. They also mm. have a special, co a separate cohort where children developed asthma, even though mothers were healthy. 
uh, in something like what you just described. Uh, and that will be really interesting to see. I mean, what role was breast milk babies playing in, in that subset? Was it trying to protect those kids from developing it? Was there an increase in a certain population of breast milk babies, certain cargo, uh, and compare it uh, to you know children who uh, didn't develop asthma, even though their mothers were healthy or whether their mothers had asthma. So right now, I mean, this was an N of five, which is ridiculously small, and you can't make any conclusions from that, especially for human studies. But thankfully, we have a large enough cohort. So what we want to do is an N of 50 from each one of those groups and do a regression analysis to see if the breast milk EV cargo, once we identify which are the most differentially expressed proteins, for example, if that is linked with asthma development in offspring, or whether it's linked with the asthma in the mother more so than the offspring. Uh, but we definitely intend to follow up and do more of that. Uh, and I think more and more folks are getting involved in looking at EVs and breast milk and asthma and, and these early childhood uh, diseases that we don't know what's causing them. It could be genetic, yeah, environmental, yeah. a combination of everything, who knows? Uh, but we have to address it because they're, they're massive, you know, it's a, it's a big burden on the kids who have to suffer through and get to school with this and as well as the parents who have to manage it. Like it's, it's hard. And the, the prevalence is decreasing. Yeah, I feel like, yeah. Like yeah. Uh, last time, I mean, yeah, uh, recently like many kids are getting this asthma and we don't know the reason. Maybe it's like, as you said, environmental, many factors. Yes, exactly. Like multi yeah, people think pollution in the environment, and that's a global problem. And which actually, the COVID pandemic made it nicer for a couple of months when pollution levels went world, you know, down worldwide. But uh, we're trying to get this combustion system set up in our labs in at Crin, where we will expose mice to exhaust fumes, and then look at moms who are pregnant. Uh, versus, you know, mice moms, obviously not human moms who are not, you can't do this with the humans, um, and expose these dams, pregnant dams, to uh, combustion fuel, to exhaust fumes, to cigarette smoke, and see the asthma development of the offspring, and especially link it to breast milk EVs. So we have lots and lots of plans to do this and follow up on it, and, uh, you know, hopefully uh, we can contribute yeah. and find something yeah and going back to your first question i i completely agree everyone's always focused on small evs um yeah. i you know we used a method that enriches for small ev extraction so i i don't want to i i don't think i can comment on what's happening in micro vesicles uh, in this group i think we need to use differential ultra centrifugation and isolate those different uh sediment sized Eat pellets at different speeds to get the micro vesicle and the EVs and, and then really see what they're doing. But you're right, they could be doing something and we have the small EV blinders on and <laughs> we're ignoring the micro vesicles <laughs> and aquatic bodies. Like, what are they doing? Or maybe you know? the interaction, yeah. Interaction also, yeah. Maybe the interaction between different vesicles from, like, I yeah. think, yeah, not much of studies addressing this, the interaction between the different vesicles of different origin and size. So, yeah, yeah absolutely. Also. I got a yeah, 20 year old. Yeah, so <laughs> for your work, and it's very interesting. Yeah. Hopefully, yeah, we, yeah we can. I think. Oh, um, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, thank you Maimona. Thank, I think um, last time um, with uh, Marka Wobben, um, her vesicles is about 200 nanometers. So that's quite interesting that possibly uh, this isolation um, methodology differences between what uh, your lab is doing and uh, Walburn lab is doing might cause that yeah. difference. But um, it is in it, um, in my case, when I look into um, the fascicles uh, at the beginning, I actually have a really difficulties to uh, isolate fascicles that is um, micro fascicle size. So mm -hmm. my fascicles is always about 120, 150 nanometers. So um, to me, it's, it's the most sort of like, you know, um, direction, real directions to go. But yeah, it, it does, uh, seems to be a lot of differences if depending on what cells is the source for that vesicles. That, and also um, your study is really interesting in showing that um, while the small EVs, um, the amount is increasing, but the CD63, which is um, 
which marker. is uh, the marker for the small vesicles is actually decreasing. Is am I right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 So the will lower in the yeah. So that was sort of like, okay, <laughs> what's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> I know. Same with HSV seventy is almost significant. So we were like, uh, that doesn't match the the size, yeah. but we're just gonna. I know, I know it's yeah. sort of like you know it, it it turns my head around as well so um what did uh, the methodology that you used to um uh to see the level of cdc3 are you using exoview or using western blood can you share? western blotting okay so we, we were using western blotting and uh the the Wabin lab, I think, uses um, size exclusion chromatography, but up to prep density gradient one. Mm -hmm. Ours is very different. So you're absolutely right. The, the type of isolation methodology, their milk was older, ours was younger. Mm -hmm. um, that could affect the size. But we did have the same concentration in our control. They had, I think, 1 times 10 to the 11. And I was so happy when I saw that because <laughs> yeah. that's literally what we have in mm -hmm. our control cells. So control uh, EV samples from the mothers that didn't have asthma. Um, but yeah, CD63, uh, fertilin were significantly decreased by Western blotting. And um, we don't know why. Maybe mm. they're not enriched in those proteins, uh, even though they have smaller EVs. Not sure. Yeah. Hmm. I think I think that's a, another big study for that. <laughs> <laughs> now the grand money can follow too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah, but EVs are so intricate, and there's so many things that are important to keep an eye on, and it's it's just really cool. But uh, yeah, we're excited. We're we're really excited to do the in vivo and the in vitro work to show crosstalk because I don't know if anyone has shown breast milk EVs from control and asthma mothers being taken up by intestinal cells. So. We oh. thought we'd get it done in a couple of months, but it's taken four months to optimize everything. So, yeah, there's yeah. always this uh, unpredictable happen. <laughs> yep. And with the COVID yep. as well. Well, exactly. mm, yeah. is there any other questions from the audience? Otherwise, uh, I'd like to conclude the sessions. And I'd like to thank uh, Aisha uh, for uh, her lectures and also um, thank you uh, for sharing with us. Uh, your data. I think it's very interesting how um, EV from different origin uh, might have different size and different marker correspond to it. That's that's something that is quite new. And I and I think uh, I haven't really seen that much in you know EV studied from the circulation. But um, well, I have only very small knowledge about breast milk EV, but both uh, from Woburn study and from your study, there seems to be a difference um, between those EV that is in the uh, blood in the circulation. So I think that's really interesting to study in the future. Thank you. 